Hi everybody and welcome to our fireside chat today. Welcome to 420 5th Avenue here at Girl Scout Central in New York City. And you know we're having a, a campfire chat and some of you may be wondering what is a campfire chat? And it's really us bringing together powerful women in our amazing Girl Scout community who are at the top of their fields to really to educate, to inspire us. You know, they're also meant to provide heartfelt dialogues that are really meaningful. And so today, you know, the Girl Scout Network, all of us have come together. It's a community of Girl Scout alums and our supporters of Girl Scouts who believe in joining together to support girls and prepare them to be leaders of the future. And I know right now in your mind, you're thinking, I know so many people who should be here or should be on listening. And you can ask them to join. You go to girlscouts.org and slash alum. And they'll be added to our Girl Scout network. Well, today's discussion means so much to me because my entire life changed because of the Girl Scout cookie program and entrepreneurship. You know, it wasn't just about selling cookies. It was about learning how to create opportunity. And for somebody like myself who was raised living paycheck to paycheck, the Girl Scout Cookie Program taught me how you could create opportunity. Because when you are raised living paycheck to paycheck, you don't know how to create opportunity. Because if you did, you wouldn't be living paycheck to paycheck and in poverty. And that's what the Girl Scout Cookie Program taught me. It taught me how to create opportunity, how to set goals, how to break them down into more achievable steps, and then put that hard work and making it happen. But in addition to that, the Girl Scout Cookie Program taught me my life skill of never leaving a site of a sale until I've heard no three times. And that has really propelled me in my career. So it wasn't just learning that important skill as a young elementary school girl that I kept flexing and practicing so that later on when people told me I couldn't play drums in marching band, ha. I learned I said I'll take that on and I did. When they told me I couldn't go to college, because girls like me didn't go to college. That was my first no, ha. And then they said, oh, but then, okay, you're going to college, but what are you going to study? I'm going to be an engineer. Ha! I beyond, not only became an engineer, I became a rocket scientist. <laughs> so all throughout my life, what I learned through the cookie program truly propelled me. And I'm just so grateful, and it wasn't just me. It was tens of millions of women like me, including the women you're going to hear from tonight. And right now, we at Girl Scouts are really taking what we have learned in the cookie program, the entrepreneurship, and really expanding it across the nation. Because we know it's not just about the cookie sale. It's about teaching girls how to ask for the order. It's about learning, yes, how to fail and get up and try again. And it's also the tools of how do you create your business? If you're selling online, how do you create that compelling video? How do you provide? great customer service, those decision-making skills that you learn, following through and giving excellent customer service. And at Girl Scouts, we have created a report, an entrepreneurship report, and this report called Today's Girls, Tomorrow's Entrepreneurs, it's our Girl Scout Research Institute, and by the way, a plug, we are the only research institute in the world who is studying girls' leadership, yes. <laughs> We are investing in Girls Today and Tomorrow. That research is available for free online. It's Today's Girls, Tomorrow's Entrepreneurs. And it's the Girl Scouts Research Institute to understand how girls today think and feel about entrepreneurship. So today I'd like to introduce Sally Davis, the director of our National Entrepreneurship Strategy. She, you know, thank you for tuning in. She's going to be our moderator today. And I'm just so grateful that you came. So it's going to be a great chat. So over to you. Thank you. As Sylvia said, I'm Chris Sally Davis, Director of Entrepreneurship Strategy here at GSUSA, and I'm joined by three amazing women who represent um, great examples of what entrepreneurship really looks like. Originally in, this, in um, my commentary, I, I listed female entrepreneurship, and I scra scratched that word because it's you represent the very best of entrepreneurship and serve as an amazing uh, example for our girls and our aspiring entrepreneurs. So thank you so much for joining us. 
Um, so I'd like to do a little intro. Uh, first, we have Miko Branch, who is the co-founder and CEO of Miss Jessie's, uh, which uh, many of you in the room here have a, a little gift bag. Sorry for those tuning in at home. Um, <laughs> it's great. Uh, so uh, this is a trailblazing, award-winning hair care product that was uh, co-founded with her sister, T.T. Branch. And it is named after, and I want to read this, her fiercely independent, do-it-yourself, Tell it like it is, paternal grandmother, Miss Jessie May Branch. Yes. <laughs> so welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Next we have <laughs> and next we have Sally Krawcheck, who is a Girl Scout alum and a co-founder of Elevest, which is a mission-driven investment platform for women. Her passion is to help women reach their financial and career potential, uh, but also to give them leverage that helps them create a ripple effect for their families, community, communities, and the economy. Mm -hmm. So thank you for joining us. And then uh, remotely, we have Britt Morin, who's joining us from California. Uh, we all agreed before we brought you in that we're not going to talk about the weather, um, <laughs> because then we'll be just jealous. Uh, but Britt is also a Girl Scout alum and founder and CEO of Britt & Co., which is a lifestyle online learning company which provides classes, content, products, experiences. They have an amazing reach with over uh, more than 125 million women who are engaged in this community and 200,000 online courses. And so this is one of the top destinations for learning and discovery for millennial women. Uh, so welcome, Brett. Thank you for joining us. So uh, today we're here to really launch our latest uh, research study from the Girl Scout Research Institute called Today's Girls, Tomorrow's Entrepreneurs. And so we're going to have a little, we're, we'll have a Q&A with our panel discussion, but um, before each question, I'd like to present one of the data points from the study so that you have something to react to. Um, oh, I keep hearing myself a little in the room. <laughs> Um, and so we will, but we'll also float with the conversation a little bit, uh, and then we'll stick around. Um, Miko and Sally ha are, have agreed to stay with us for a Q&A, um, and we'll let Britt go on with the rest of her day. And then we will also take some questions from girls we've gathered online and questions in the room. Sound like a plan? Yeah. Awesome. All right, so a little background on the research. So we, we conducted this research because we really wanted to understand girls' perceptions, experience, um, and curiosity and aspirations around entrepreneurship. There was a lot of data out in the world about women and, and entrepreneurship. 39% of women, 39% um, of businesses are owned by women. Um, we read a lot about the barriers that women face, but we didn't know a lot about what girls are experiencing and how they perceive entrepreneurship. So we couldn't, we've done a lot in entrepreneurship. You might have heard of the cookie program, um, but we haven't um, really branched out beyond that. And before we could do that, we really needed to understand the mind of a girl. And so this research gave us a window into that. And and we will be using this as we invest in that um, entrepreneurship strategy that Sylvia talked about. And so when we, we found in the research that girls are um, aspirational towards entrepreneurship, I was really surprised to find that um, girls are already thinking like entrepreneurs, they are curious about entrepreneurship, um, as well as they are already thinking and they have this mindset of an entrepreneur. So some of you out there may be thinking, well, not every girl wants to be an entrepreneur, uh, but we can really change the face of leadership if we allow girls to, all girls, to develop an entrepreneurial mindset and think like an entrepreneur. So to start us off um, with that kind of entrepreneurial minded girl, and, and when, when I say entrepreneurial minded, I'm talking about girls who are creative thinkers, challenge seekers, risk takers, um, they're collaborative teamsters, they're curious learners, I could go on and on, they're problem solvers um, with a social bend to that. Uh, so thinking about that, uh, before we dig into the research and the, and the hard questions, I'd like for each of you to paint a picture for us of your middle school self. Um, and I want to start there. <laughs> I like Sally's face there. Um, because it's very easy to look at you and put you on a pedestal. I might have a little imposter syndrome flaring up today sharing this stage with you. Um, so tell us about your middle school self and um, how, how that person helped shape uh, where you've ended up so far in your career. Anyone brave enough to start? I have someone in mind, if not. Oh, Britt. <laughs> All right, let's start with Britt. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> By the way, I can't see you guys, so you can just always throw to me when you're when you want me to start. Um, but um, oh my God, my middle school self. Middle school is such a transformational journey. <laughs> um, I feel like by the time I got to eighth grade, I was on a way better trajectory than sixth grade. Um, you know, I think um, first of all, you're really insecure. Um, sixth grade, you go from being like the top of the totem pole. In fifth grade to the bottom. Um, you're getting introduced to a bunch of new like topics that you've never heard about before from the older kids. And um, for me, I've always been just like this perfectionist, you know, person. I, even in elementary school, I was like the class president and all these things. And it felt like I was in this bigger sea and I had a lot more to live up to and I was scared. And friend groups changed and everything was just weird. And so, you know, for me, it was a really transformative time because I was faced with like two different directions of the types of friend groups I could participate in. And, you know, I was I was kind of, I was an athlete and I was in some of the advanced classes and so that was one group. And then there were, you know, groups of girls who were getting into like some pretty bad stuff, but they were my friends from elementary school. And so that was another group and I actually was leaning into that group pretty hard. And I think one of the things I'll always thank my mom for is actually restricting me from, from, from hanging out um, with my best friend who was part of that group and instead, you know, that forced me to like engage more with these other groups of girls and I just felt like they really propelled me to be a better person because I wanted to be at the top of my game literally on the field. I played soccer in the classroom and I wanted to do the good things and so I think more than anything like your social decisions and you know, it's you're, you're the sum of the like closest probably five to ten people you surround yourselves with. And I think that's a quote that's been said over and over again and I felt that couldn't ring more true for me in middle school and that truly changed my trajectory. Great, thank you. Anyone else brave enough to describe their, their middle school self? Yeah. yeah, so I, by the time I, I reached middle school, I had already started to understand that I loved doing hair. I'm, I'm a native New Yorker. I grew up in Queens, and as a girl <laughs> on 127th Street, it wasn't uncommon for me to do uh, my friend's first box braids. And back in the day, you know, in order for us to style our hair, many of us, I lived in a primarily African-American neighborhood with, you know, a splash of Latino, Latina, and I had a lot of um, interesting friends, but I loved hair. And um, by the time I got to middle school, I really got a chance to hone in on my craft. So while I was really trying to figure out how I fit in, and my dad and my mom decided that they were gonna take me out of this primarily black neighborhood and bus me to a primarily white neighborhood in Whitestone, Queens. And I really had to kind of understand who I was and how I fit in. And hair was a wonderful way for me to make friends, whether she'd be the girl from Jamaica, Queens, or the girl from Hollis, Queens, or even the girl from Whitestone or Bayside. I was able to interact and make friends with people based on beauty and what I can do with your hair. So some of my girlfriends, you know, they were one, she was my best friend. Her name was Patty Camparetto. And, um, she let me do her hair. So my hair texture was different than Patty Caporetto's hair texture, so I used to put a lot of grease and water in my hair. And grease and water did wonders for my hair, and I told Patty Caporetto, who had straight hair, Patty, can I do your hair, and can I put all the stuff that I put in my hair in your hair? She said, sure. <laughs> I, put ton, I put a ton of grease in Patty's hair, and she loved me, and I loved her, and she wore her hair, and her hair looks totally greasy. <laughs> um, but although we had different hair textures, we were able to bond through beauty. And that was the seed, that was, you know, that was the beginning of my understanding of forming relationships. And over time, I'd gotten good at it. So I was really fortunate and I was really grateful that I was able to take something that gave me joy as a kid, that gave me um, confidence to be able to forge uh, relationships and make friends. I was, I, was, I was fortunate to be able to take that and translate that into a business that I would later form with my sister. So that's kind of like, that was my bridge you know that was my transition beauty you know when it came to the social part of Miko uh, in middle school thank you Miko so um it was the best of times it was the worst of times. <laughs> uh, seventh grade was the worst of times I um, was geeky 
and not athletic, um, and glasses that were unfortunate. They were very <laughs> thick, and for whatever reason, I decided to tint them yellow because that was an option. Um, I wore corrective shoes. I had if. This won't ring a bell with the young folks in the audience, but a Dorothy Hamill haircut. It was unfortunate, the whole thing. Um, and I was an outcast. I was one of the last chosen for the school teams, and I ate lunch by myself. And so I have real empathy for young people who feel outcast. And like Britt, my mother changed it all. Because my mother, um, seeing that I was suffering and seeing that I was struggling to find a way out, actually took me out of that school. Um, and sent me to another school. And what was really interesting, my grades had plummeted because I was being bullied so badly, so I'd gone from A's to C's. And my mother took me out, and the school she sent me to was harder than the one I was in, a full grade ahead. And so essentially, she took a kid who was earning C's, skipped a grade, and went over to eighth grade to another school, and it was the best of times because I, my braces got taken off that summer <laughs> and I discovered contact lenses and hello eighth grade. And I, I had a crush on a different boy every week. It was really <laughs> the beginning, but what is really interesting is, is it's still today. You know, I spent my career before becoming an entrepreneur on Wall Street and uh, when people say, boy, Wall Street's so tough. How do you do it? How do you manage? And I say, well, nothing's worse than seventh grade. <laughs> and so there is a little bit of that still, if I'm going to be honest. There's a little bit of the see girls in seventh grade. See, look at my, you know, look at what, look at what's going on here. Um, just a little bit of motivation. So I have to admit, I listened to an interview you did with, and now I'm forgetting who. I went down a rabbit hole on the three of you, and I was inspired. I, you talked about your seventh grade self on one of those interviews, and I wanted, I wanted to paint that picture because before you talked about that, you talked about your career and all of the things you had done and leading with your values, and then you talked about your seventh grade self, and it sounded like a different person, and I just thought that was so, and so I wanted to hear the other seventh grade selves. So. And so, you know, for those girls out there who were struggling, you know, getting through it and then using it as motivation for the right people say, you know, I, look, I've gotten fired a couple times in public. And why don't you, why don't you stop, Sally? Why don't you go back to your hometown, give it up? And like, nope, I'm not letting those girls in seventh grade see me go down. <laughs> <laughs> They're not in seventh grade anymore, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So uh, back to the research. So thank you for sharing your, your, the vision of your middle school self. Um, so our research shows that six out of ten girls are already, already have an entrepreneurial mindset. So they're, they're um, innovative, they're collaborative, um, and they're curious learners. Can you, thinking back, and so maybe not to middle school, but can you tell us about some of the first early indicators that you had this entrepreneurial mindset um, that has led you to the success you've had so far as a founder and a CEO? Uh, let's go ahead and start with uh, Britt in California. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Um, well, I mean, honestly, the Girl Scout cookie program was part of it, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, for me, I've always wanted to be an inventor. And um, ever since I was little, I remember, you know, after soccer games, I asked every girl on my team if I could have their empty Capri Sun because I wanted to stitch it into a tote bag <laughs> because Capri Suns are like waterproof, so it's like the perfect beach bag. And then I remember when I did that and then I would carry it around and people wanted to buy one from me. And so like, I was like, maybe I can sell some. And, and so there was that. Um, then, you know, all my friends would call me and ask, and even their moms would sometimes call me <laughs> and ask if I could like help them plan their birthday parties. Um, and so, like in a funny way, I think I could have had an event business when I was younger, but I didn't charge for that. Um, but I was entrepreneurially almost there. Um, it is little things like that. I mean, so back in, in my middle school, going back to middle school, um, burning CDs was like a thing. So you download music from the internet and burn it onto a CD. And I did charge for that too, so I did have a business there. Um, but I've been entrepreneurial throughout my entire life. And I thought it was, you know, I, I really, I called it being an inventor when I was little, but I didn't real, I didn't even know what the word entrepreneur was. And so that really all changed for me when I started looking back on it. And then the Girl Scout story is funny because, you know, we didn't have the internet back then and, 
and we just got the sheets, the you know, the order sheets of paper. And so I just asked for a bunch of them, and then I gave them to my parents. And I asked my parents to each give them to ten of their friends at work, <laughs> to, to give them to ten friends. And so I didn't know it, but I was employing this whole pyramid scheme kind of thing. <laughs> I didn't to go door to door that much. So I guess that was entrepreneurial in a whole different way. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, like Brick and Co, my company was 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 formed um, out of like just who I am. I, I looked back at you know my I was 25 when I started it, um, and I was like, I've always loved making things. I've always liked making things for other people, solving problems by making things that solve those problems. And so what if other women could do that too? What if they believed in themselves to do that too? And so, you know, I get cast a lot in the public as like a Martha Stewart for millennials. Um, but it's more than that. It's like, you know, I love Martha Stewart, don't get me wrong, but she really taught, you know, the homemaking generation how to sew and how to bake cakes and like, I want to teach this generation how to do whatever they want to do. If they want to like sell and bake cakes and throw parties, awesome. I love that. If they want to start a company, awesome. If they want to be, become an investor, that's amazing. And so I just want women to feel unlocked. And and um, it's so true to who I am at my core that I know there's actually nothing else I could probably do in life other than that. So here I am today. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Miko. So, you know, um, <clears throat> The Girl Scouts, you know, as a girl in Queens, the Girl Scouts was really aspirational for my sister Titi and I. And our parents just didn't, I, I don't think they had the time to really be the backups that we needed to participate as a Girl Scout. Uh, but, you know, I'd love to say that I woke up and I was like this natural entrepreneur, but it didn't happen that way for me. Um, I was raised by a dad who thought it was really important that my sister Titi and I be free in our minds, be independent women. Uh, my dad was somewhat of a ladies man, <laughs> so he knew all the traps and he knew all the pit holes um, that were out there for women. And uh, ironically, he was blessed with two girls. So he thought the best way to arm us and prepare us for life was to make us independent and make us be able to do for ourselves and it was, a, it, was, it was something that he drilled into us every day, like as babies, you know? So my dad raised T.D. and I as boys. He put us to work. Mm -hmm. And my dad was an entrepreneur, and he did everything from drive cabs. He was a teacher. He painted houses. He did everything to make ends meet. But he also made my sister and I help him. So if my dad was doing real estate, you know, this year, <laughs> Titi and I had to plaster walls and paint and sweep, you know, while many of our friends had a wonderful opportunity, had the wonderful opportunity to be Girl Scouts. Um, so by the time he drilled that in to Titi and I, around seven years old, we were seven, I was seven, Titi was eight, and we used to watch this show called The Brady Bunch. And we used to see all the Brady kids splash around in their pool in the backyard, and we just didn't have the money. But my sister and I were no strangers to hard work, so we decided that if we sold lemonade and Kool-Aid, which took ice, water, sugar, lemon, and packets of Kool-Aid and cups and pitcher, if we sold enough, maybe we can buy, our, we can buy a pool. <laughs> and we bought, <laughs> we made this wonderful, delicious ice, uh, excuse me, Kool-Aid and lemonade, and we sold $25 worth of drinks, refreshments, beverages. And with that money, we were able to go and get a plastic pool. And at seven and eight years old, Titi and I were able to put that pool in our backyard, fill it up with water, put our bathing suits on, and splash around in this pool. So at a very early age, with the help of our dad and with the hard work that he instilled in us, we understood that, you know, the fruits of our labor, it was a possibility. So at a very young age, I understood that that was something that was doable, and if I worked hard, that I could probably get many of the things that I wanted. So shout out to my dad, Jimmy Branch, for raising me as a boy. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't do any of that. I didn't sell the lemonade, and I didn't, I don't think I ever sold very many cookies. Um, none of that happened for me as a little girl. I will tell you though, I'm endlessly curious and I love to learn. And you know, I think we're on this earth for 
eight decades, nine decades, ten, not very long in the scheme of things. And maybe we come back, but I don't know that. So this is what we've got. So how much can you learn? And the second thing is, you know, and having learned from the Girl Scouts, a life of service. When you're here and if you're given so much, what can you give back and what can you do? And so Ellevest is an investing platform for women. Um, I founded it after years and years of working on Wall Street and working in the investing industry when I recognized that women don't invest as much as men do. And that my industry always sort of blamed women for it. Well, they're very risk averse and they're not as good at math and they're not as good investors and their husbands do it for them. Um, and it cost women not investing a fortune over the course of our lives. And for some women, it cost us the ability to leave a bad relationship, to leave a job we hate, to start the company we want to. Not investing as much as the men in our lives do cost us life-changing amounts of money. And so as I looked and said, well, I love to learn, and I want to be of service, and who, you know, who can, who's got the years on Wall Street in order to start this company? Who can go out and raise the outside money that's needed? Who can put together the technology? Who, who can do that? And realized, because Wall Street doesn't have very many women in it, that that person would have to be me. And so if I can make a difference in the lives of the girls who are listening by helping them invest, you know, and change their lives, then that was something I had to do. So I, I don't know that if I hadn't come up with the concept of Elevest, I would have. It wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, I just have this drive, I have to be an entrepreneur. It was more, I love to learn, I need to be of service because I've been so fortunate. How can I do that as opposed to I have to start something? You saw a need. That's, that's a great transition into our next data point. <laughs> so, and You're welcome. <laughs> You're making this very easy. So entrepreneurship is often associated with a startup or a venture capital investment um, with a focus on profit, which is important. Uh, but we, as Girl Scouts, we know, and girls told us in the survey, that they're interested in getting more out of entrepreneurial innovation. They want to make a difference. 84% um, of girls want to lead a cause or a campaign that they believe in. Um, so can you each talk about, and Sally, you, or you kind of touched on this, um, the impact that you hoped that your business would have on the world, and then if that has evolved over time. Yeah. Britt. Yeah, so I think I alluded to this before. By the way, I can see you guys now, and it makes me feel so much more connected. Um, that was beautiful. Um, so, yeah, when I was starting, I was, like I said, 25. Um, I just had a, a blog on the internet and I would post like random creative projects I was doing and I was about to get married and so I was doing a lot of them and I was making everything for my wedding and, and all of the comments from all of my girlfriends and just other women in the posts were like, oh, that's amazing. I wish I were creative and like, I wish I were creative. I wish I could do that. I don't know how to do that, but I could never do that. And like, it just drove me crazy because I feel like I'm a creative person, but like I'm not the most creative person and I figured it out and so why can't you? And and so it came down to this fundamental truth, which I found, which is that, you know, somewhere between when we're little and we will do any creative project and believe that it is the best project that's ever been done, to the time we're 25, like something happens in there, probably is middle school, um, and we start getting really insecure with our creative skills, and we, we think it has to be like fine art in order to be creative, when in fact, like we as humans are just made to be creative people. We have to cook to make food for ourselves every day. We have to get dressed and like decide what colors go together and do our makeup, and and so um, it just drove me crazy. And and that's really like the heart of where Britain Co came from was how do we help women learn that they're creative um, and that creativity is everything around them every day and it has evolved it's been eight years almost to the day actually we celebrated that this week and, and and it actually went a step deeper which is that like as we were as i was preaching you know creativity to these women for so many years i i learned that it's actually like even deeper than that and that they are not actually that courageous they are insecure they're afraid um, they're not being brave and taking those big risks because you know they're starting families they're getting married they're maybe in their first or second job and it's too scary and they don't believe in themselves and so we recently added in like this notion of courage and to our manifesto and our mission and, and it sort of happened because of something I did really on a whim which was 
you know, last year I um, usually, you know, fail at all my New Year's resolutions like most people do. Um, so instead, I decided that a new strategy is going to be that I was going to make 52 New Year's resolutions that were going to be smaller goals, and I would chip off one of them every week. And I called it Give It a Week, and I did everything from like uh, every type of diet and workout, every type of creative. I learned guitar, I learned to sing, I learned to dance, I learned like all these cake decorating skills, I, I learned Spanish, I tried zero waste, I just, I went blonde, um, <laughs> I tried everything. And I put it all on the internet, and it sparked women. And so, um, you know, it's, it, they started doing it too, and it became this whole thing. And now it's just proof, I think, that like, you know, I did this thing for myself, but I am my audience. And so, what's probably true for me is true for them. And how I help myself is probably how I help them. It's not that's the same in every business, but for mine, it is. And so, that's really been unique to me. Is like that's the mission. I'm so passionate. And about solving for me and for everyone else that's like you know around me um and and i think i always call it like the adult version of girl scouts <laughs> because i know like the girl scouts is all about giving courage confidence character creativity to these girls and, and i want to do the same thing for women thank you miko or <clears throat> well uh, for me um i've been fortunate enough to be able to see some of my ideas many of my ideas that I developed with my sister Titi come true. Uh, in 19, excuse me, in 2000, I had my son, I'm a single parent, and uh, my sister and I had been in business for two years. We opened up our first uh, uh, hair salon in the Barn Hill section of Brooklyn, and we just grew too fast. And we grew so fast that we made some rookie moves, and we ended up losing our business. Thank God in 1999, um, the year before I had my son, we purchased a brownstone in the Bedford-Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn. And we went on this wonderful block <laughs> called Hancock Street and we purchased this brownstone and um, they were asking $245,000. And we tried out our negotiating skills and we were able to get the guy down to $215,000. And we bought a brownstone. And that was the year before we lost our business. Um, during the rough year in business, I was pregnant and having a hard time. We lost our business. We refuged to this brownstone. And it was really important that I be in my son's life. It was really important that he see me. It was really important that um, everything that I did involve my son. So, even though we lost our business in the Borm Hill section of Brooklyn, if you wanted to still get your hair done by Titi or Miko, you would have to take the A train to No Street Avenue in Brooklyn, where back in 1999, Red Style was known as the Bonafide Hood, and you would have to get your hair done by me in the house. I would give my son baths on the fourth floor, and he would splash all around, and ironically, even though I specialize in curly, kinky, and wavy hair. I love wearing my hair straight. But because my son was a big splasher, once water hit my hair, does anyone know what happens to our hair when water hits it? So my hair goes east, west, never south, always north. And for the small few, you know, clients that we had left that would come to Bedford Stuyvesant to get their hair done, they had to see my hair frizzy. They had to see my hair up, down, east, west. And ironically, many of those customers liked my hair. And I was like, what? What do you like? How do you get your hair like that? And that was before we were embracing our curls, kinks and waves. And I understood that this was an opportunity because I'd always been good at doing hair. I just needed to become a curly hair expert. I quickly became an expert. But at the time, there were no Miss Jessies in Target, Walmart, Walgreens, and CVS. So what my sister and I did was we took to our kitchen table, and although we weren't, we, we, didn't, we didn't have a chemistry background, and although we knew nothing about making products, we knew that we had to make good on the promises we were making these women who were coming to our brownstone to get their hair done. We were able to do wonderful haircuts, wonderful styling, but we needed to keep those styles intact. So we took to our kitchen table the way we learned from our grandmother, Jessie Mae Branch, and we made it ourselves. 
and we would give samples to our customers and we would ask them, do you like this, do you like that? But it was actually my sister Titi Branch who stayed up a little bit or a lot bit later than I did because I was the sister with the baby. So after working and after feeding my son and playing with him, I would go to sleep. Titi stayed up late, later than me. And one day, 3 o'clock in the morning, she knocked on my door because we all had a floor in our brownstone. She said, Miko, I got it. And what Titi showed me was curly pudding. And curly pudding is our first product to market. It's purple. It looks like pudding. It does what it says it's going to do. It turns your kinks to curls. It's good for any type of curly, kinky, or wavy hair. And what we did was we changed the beauty business. We revolutionized the beauty industry. And at the time where there was no category for curly, natural, kinky, or wavy hair, my sister and I created it. And we did the unthinkable, and we marketed it to women who didn't even know they had curly hair. <laughs> many women with, the, with a tighter coil curl for many years was told that their hair was maybe bad and not good. They were told either intentionally by their people who loved them and people who hated them that your hair is bad. Some of our grandmothers told us our hair was nappy or ugly. They loved us, but they still had negative things to say. But that time, bath time with my son where I could no longer wear my hair curly and I had to embrace, excuse me, no longer wear my hair straight, had to embrace the curls, understood this was an opportunity, became an expert at curl, styling curly hair, made curly pudding with my sister. We understood that this was too big of a secret to keep to ourselves. The name of the stylist game and the name of the salon game is to keep all the secrets to yourself and never tell your customers. Why? We want you to come back every week, every two weeks, so we can service you. But because we understood that this was too big of a secret and many people needed to know that if they put curly pudding in their hair, they didn't have to use chemicals. They can embrace what God gave them naturally. And we thought that if we put up before and after pictures and told each one how we did it, and then we took to video, and then we went to how-tos and this, then it would change how people saw themselves. Very early on, we thought that we were just offering hair solutions, but TD and I didn't know that we were playing a huge role in restoring some esteem that had been lost along the way for many years, many generations. So now when I walk, at, walk down the street, now when I you know, meet someone who works at uh, Girl Scouts, and when I look around the room, I see so much texture where in the early 2000s, we were all trying to straighten our hair, including myself. So I got a chance to really see my vision really come true. And um, luckily, my sister and I, before she passed away in December of 2014, we were, we were noted and we, we were recognized as pioneers in the hair care business. And uh, it just brings me so much joy to be able to see that life change, that lifestyle change, that good intention, that, that desire to be helpful really, really take form. So um, that's my story. Great, thank you. So it's interesting because um, as I listen to both of you, um, and then I think about what we're trying to do at Elevest, it really is for all three of us about confidence. Um, although interestingly, approaching it from the creativity, from the appearance, and then from the money um, angle. So, you know, our mission at Elevest is based on the fact that today, money is women's number one source of stress. Mm -hmm. Today, the act of doing something about it, taking control, investing or saving, is the number one driver of our confidence and our ability to achieve our future goals. Um, and we have been brainwashed in a way that is mentioned before that investing is really for men or that investing will take a lot of time. Who's got the time for it? Actually, at Elvis, it takes 10 or 15 minutes. It can, you know, depending on, on what, your, you know, what your personal circumstances are. Um, so for us, by getting money in the hands of women, we are transforming their lives and increasing their confidence. It's as simple as that. And you know, investing is a form of lean-in. Lean-in's great, right? Everybody needs to lean-in. Everybody needs to do your job to the utmost of your ability. Um, the, you know, a challenge can be, you know, in the workforce, if your boss is a jerk, which happens, girls, right? It can happen. Your boss can be a jerk, or your boss can be a lovely, lovely person who just never seems to promote people who look like you. Um, or you could be in the wrong job. I spent my entire 20s in exactly the wrong jobs. 
And so, you know, being your best at work is very important, but one thing I don't think we talk about often enough is sometimes things happen at work that are beyond your control and aren't your fault. Mm -hmm. Investing is a choice you can make, right? Investing is something that you can do, and while, you know, as the girls on the, the um, webcast will learn, the markets can go up and down over time. Um, wealth in this country has been built really in two important ways. One of those ways is home ownership, which has not been available to everyone. And another of those ways is investing, which has not been available to everyone. And so what was really important for us at Elevest is to have no investing minimum, that historically it's been something that's been available to wealthy people. Oh, you have to have X thousand dollars or X hundred thousand dollars in order to invest. We make it so that one in, can invest with a penny. I mean, it's hard for me to give you a diversified investment portfolio with a penny, <laughs> but a dollar and then begin, you know, sort of begin to have that experience. And over time, the markets have with vol, you know, uh, wiggle a little bit, but have gone up. And so that is one of the reasons today that women have not been investing as much as men have, that we'll retire with two thirds of money of a man. It's not the only reason, but it's one reason. It's a reason that we can actually decide to take action on. And so for us, you know, it's very much about confidence and our goal is to move from today where men, when you talk about money, feel confidence and strength, that's what comes to their mind. For too many women, it's still uncertainty and loneliness. Mm -hmm. And so changing that mindset and giving her the confidence that having some bank leads to um, is another way of increasing you know, her, the, the life she's, improving the life she's living. Yeah, you're you're leading into two other questions. I'm sitting here again, debating again, myself. I know you're, you're, you're welcome. So there's two. But now I'm like, do I go to this one? Or do I go to this one? I'm going back and forth. So, um, so you're touching on um, something that girls. Um, well, there are a few things that girls said are important to them when they think about their career futures. Um, one of them is is their impact on the world, but also they talked about financial stability. So I think that um, it's interesting to hear you talk about that. Girls are recognizing it and saying that it's important to them. And there's a disparity between um, the financial education girls want and the financial education they get. And so programs like Girl Scouts and, and also as girl, women, if girls turn into women, um, Alabast is so important for girls. So, so we're seeing that in the research. Well, and thank goodness for Girl Scouts because in so many of our schools today, we don't have, per, you know, we don't teach personal finance. Mm -hmm. And so my kids, you know, first of all, I'm just gonna be honest, I've never used algebra trigonometry mm -hmm. since I graduated. In fact, since the end of 10th grade. So I feel like we could get rid of trig and put personal finance in there, but until we do, the program here is so important because that is a, you know, that if you get off on the wrong foot in that early in your adult life, it can, you know, it can have effects on you for years, if not decades. And so learning those basics and getting that right from the beginning is key. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, another kind of hurdle that is in the backs of girls' minds as they're taking, as they're looking at this, is the fact that um, three in four girls see their gender as a hurdle to success in entrepreneurship. They think that they would have to work harder to succeed because of their gender, and this perception um, actually is heightened as girls get older and become more aware of the world around them. Um, and while they, most girls agree that. Um, women and men are equally capable uh, they, to become a CEO or a founder of a company, uh, they still believe that more men are more likely to actually do it. So um, I'd like to hear your reaction to that, um, that the, I have wrote perception, but it's actually to that hurdle, it's not a perception. Um, and then any advice you might have to adults who are working with girls um, to help them overcome uh, this hurdle? Britt, can we start with you? Yeah. Of course. Um, you know, as I was thinking about this, I want so badly to say, oh, it's all changing. It's going to be okay. But the reality is it's not. Um, it's changing, but it's, it's not done yet. And we're trying so hard. And I actually feel like now more than ever is when the most change is happening. So it's exciting. Um, but it is. Like, I'm sure, you know, Sally, Jeff, like you guys can probably attest, like, not done yet and and um, you know here in California at least um, so I live in the world of Silicon Valley um, and you know a lot of the the conversation is about how few female founders there are and so a lot of the the conversation is rooted around how do we get more women to become entrepreneurs and start companies 
And it's not that simple. When you look at that, root, the root cause is not necessarily that the women are, are trying to start companies, it's that they're not getting funded. And why are they not getting funded? Well, because most of the investors are older white men and you aren't funding them. And so um, it really has to go kind of like one or two levels above in order to impact everything down below. And so um, another another interesting thing that's happened is, is that California now has a law that requires that you know all companies have at least one woman on the board, which I think is amazing. Um, and it's opened up the floodgates um, to so many women joining boards who are therefore helping to find great female executives and CEOs and ensure that the companies are doing diligence within themselves for gender parity, um, you know, for for everything that they're they're deciding internally, the way they even talk externally to women versus men, and it's just giving better oversight to these companies overall. And I think I think that's huge because you know so many of the world's biggest businesses are based here in California, and that is going to I think go a long way. So I'm really highly optimistic that we're going to make a lot of serious progress over the next 10 or 20 years. Right now, it's not done yet, but it's like we are on it, and I'm I'm so excited for especially the Gen Z generation to get into the workforce because you're going to probably have the most fun um, than any generations had, only because these previous generations of women have worked their butts off trying to make this progress happen, and, and it is changing. So I I'm just optimistic. So I, I chose the beauty business, mm -hmm. and I chose an area that I'm strong. You know, um, I don't. I, I, I'm sure they're out there, but uh, I think I I knew more about what needed to be mixed to get the right curly pudding concoction. I thought that I I had maybe a leg up on maybe a, a room full of men or a room full of investors on what my clients needed. So I chose an industry that I probably knew more than anyone, you know, Titi and I. And in terms of like, you know, raising capital, we did it the hard way. You know, we didn't have special contacts. Um, we didn't have the sophistication to go to a bank and ask for a loan. Uh, we bootstrapped. Um, my sister was an excellent communicator. She was an excellent big sister. She was an excellent organizer. And in the early days in our partnership, I was an excellent hairstylist. That's how I came into the partnership. And TT called every single person in New York, and she wanted to know if they needed a hairstylist. Luckily, it was Ashley Stewart, which is a retail chain for full-figured women. And I did one week worth of hair and um, I made $8,000, and that was our seed money. And we did things like sacrifice, like in our 20s in New York, it was a very exciting time. It was the puffy era. All of our <laughs> friends were at Puff Daddy's party, and all of my girlfriends spent a lot of money, and we would do like small things, but big things like not go to the party. We shared clothes, we drove the same car, we were roommates. We took in a roommate. And we put we kept overhead low, but we put a premium on our services and on our products. And with that with that equation and with that approach to building capital, we were able to build capital slowly but surely. I think it was a combination of us in how we built capital and also the combination of us choosing an area where we were strong as women, where we were able to dodge a lot of the um, a lot of the blocks that maybe many of us encounter when we're asking men for, you know, an infusion, an infusion of cash, or we're asking men to help us in our businesses. And, you know, honestly, I believe that, you know, there's so many Titi Amicos in this world. It's not just Titi Amico who are good at organizing and who are good at doing hair. You know, I believe that anyone who can put together, you know, a Thanksgiving meal, you have the ability, you have the qualifications to come up with a finished product or a finished service. I think it's a matter of understanding that this is a valuable thing. This is something that could get a price tag to go with it. And then with that simple approach to it, you're in business and then you'll be able to grow your business. Some of us grow it the way Titi and I did and some of us, you know, get an infusion of cash. It doesn't necessarily have to be from men. But you asked me, like, what, what kind of advice would I give to 
to girls. To girls. I would encourage girls, particularly girls, to choose something that you like and choose something that you're good at. This way, you always have control over what you're doing. I don't know any entrepreneur who, have, who has not faced challenges, so the passion and the love and the joy for what you do is really gonna serve you well, and that when those challenges come, and they will, you'll still have the love and the joy so you're able to get back on the horse and try again. So for any girl, I would say choose something that you love, and you know, if you can, if there's something that you're already good at, choose something that you're good at so you'll be in a position of strength. Yeah, I would, I think we have to really support each other. Um, I'd say the men and the boys, somehow they figured this out a long time ago. And maybe it was when they were all playing football um, <laughs> and my generation, we were all cheerleaders. And somehow they learned that business is actually a team sport and that they did business with each other and promoted each other and hired each other and talked each other up and hired each other's kids and funded each other's businesses. And, you know, whereas we women in my generation sort of knew that if you were going to be senior in a big job, that you were only going to be only the only woman. There wasn't going to be six of you you know, in a leadership team of 12. There was gonna be one, maybe two. And so I hate to say this, but we were taught, never explicitly, but sort of taught that we were competing. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, one of it, well, I wasn't competing with you, sir, I was competing with you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, and so what's been important to me about Elevest is that we are trying to support women the whole way through, not exclude the men, not exclude the men, but, when it was time for us to uh, raise money, outside money, um, I sat back and spent quite a bit of time thinking, who are the people who are mission aligned with us? Who can we get in to invest in us, who I would want to get these returns, if they are women, if they are our male allies, because they are investing in other women. And so if we're a valuable business, they make more money, they can invest it again. And, so we went out and really carefully targeted um, mission-aligned investors. Mm -hmm. And then making sure that our company reflects the diversity in our world around us. That it isn't you know, the folks who have been successful in our line of business only, but that it reflects that we are, our engineering team is more than half women. Our leadership team is 75% women. We're 48% women of people of color. And so we try to be really reflective of it. And then I will, I try to help as many women who are entrepreneurs, particularly who are raising money, as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. Because the recognition needs to be not that we compete, but that particularly as entrepreneurs, that the more of us that are successful, the more of us can be successful. What do I mean by that? As Britt knows, because she's raised outside venture funding, venture capitalists are people who fund the business pattern recognition. Pattern recognition. What does that mean? I made money on someone who looks like you before in a business that's kind of like the one you're in before, who kind of went to the same school as you did before, so therefore I'm going to fund you. And if they funded all of a certain type, all of, you know, from this school or this gender or this skin color or this type of business, then when you walk in, you know, you don't have a chance or you have a very small chance. And so in entrepreneurialism, even more than corporate America, the more of us who are successful, the more the people who fund it will pattern, do pattern recognition, and make more of us successful. So we should actively support each other, cheer for each other, do business with each other. And look, one of the important moments for me at Elevest was when a very successful woman, as we were thinking about a product extension, a very successful woman said, well, I want some more sophisticated products for me. And I'm like, no, nah, you know, we're good. I'm not going to build a big, no, we're good. And she said to me, Sally, I'm tired. You know, I want to support this. Thank you. And then she said, and I'm tired of supporting businesses that haven't supported me. And I'm tired of supporting businesses in which I wouldn't want my daughter to work. Mm -hmm. And that comment, and I thought if we all lived our values, if every one of us supported businesses whose values aligned with ours, and didn't support businesses that we wouldn't want our children to work in or we wouldn't want ourselves to work in, we could change mm -hmm. corporate America. In fact, I'd say as women, 
our message of you are alone. You know, no, we're not. We're half of the workforce. We direct 80% of consumer spending. We are six, seven trillion dollars of investable assets. If, when we decide, I'm not saying if, when we decide to use that power, then we can change a lot. Okay. So I actually wanted to ask a second phase of that question, and you're doing a great job again of getting <laughs> into this. So, and we planned this ahead of time. No, I'm not. Um, so we've talked a lot about, you, you know, we've talked, even within colleagues here and across the country, I've had this conversation a lot about how we build more resilient, give girls more grit, how we prepare them and overcome barriers. And But at what point, um, what changes do you think that society needs to make in order con to continue to support and encourage women and girls in entrepreneurship so, and in business? So we've heard um, you talk about lifting up other women, uh, but what are women lifting up other, other women, but what um, what does our society need to do, and not just putting it on girls to, to build stronger organizations like Girl Scouts to build stronger girls, and um, how can we as a society evolve? Um, and I'll let you guys jump in however you want to the call out. Anybody want to go? I'll start. Just <laughs> we, have a, we have a rhythm. Um, <laughs> I always feel, I feel like you two are getting the better answers because you have more time to think about it. <laughs> It's not a competition. You're doing a great job. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm a um, um, No, but this is one. This is interesting because um, you know, I think especially in the last ten years, we've seen whether it's the Me Too stuff or just like women on boards, women entrepreneurs. Like, there's all these different you know topical matters that have come up, and in many ways, it's united women in a really positive way come together, support each other, you know, and now there's co-working spaces specifically for women. There are all kinds of women's meetup groups, women's, you know, digital communities. And I think that's all really valuable. Um, and what I'm about to say might be controversial, but I, I truly believe it's it's real, which is that I think the biggest societal change that could happen is that more men are jumping into these circles to support women. You know, I think men are getting cast and a lot of these topics is like being the big, ugly, you know, bad guy. When in fact, like they, to Sally's point, are in all of these men's groups, like golf outings, like whatever they're doing when they are, you know, advancing themselves in business. And for them to, to pull a couple women in each would be so impactful. And so I feel like, you know, for me even, like some of my biggest mentors are men, and, and I'm really proud of that. I also have female mentors, of course, but you know, there are just so many different types of learnings that a, a woman or a girl can get because of a, a different perspective that a man might have. And, and in fact, you know, I love working around men because I notice that many times like they are less risk averse. They make a decision and believe it. I've noticed in, in, in venture capital and funding pitch meetings, they will sell you to the moon about how successful their business is gonna be without a doubt, there are no risks involved, like it's gonna be a home run grand slam. And, and often when I watch women pitch, these are the three things that could go wrong, I'm not sure, but like you can <laughs> happen, but if we do it right, it could be this thing. And so, and so um, I'm inspired by the men because I want that confidence. Like that's exactly you know what I think some women should be doing more of. Um, and so, anyways, I, I think that really, if, if society came together, um, if we formed these women's groups, we've got the men's groups. Now we need to mesh them, and it truly will go a long way. Great, thank you. What's coming to mind is um, courage and esteem, and you ask, what could we do to encourage primarily girls to be their best selves and be better? And I think it comes, for me, it comes from the inside. Um, I definitely love the strategies and how we could, you know, uh, partner with men and, and, and all that, that stuff. But I think the inside is really kind of standing out to me. So when I think about the inside, I think about courage, and I think about being fearless and another word that comes to mind is the word no and as a younger Miko I was so afraid of the word no uh, no meant rejection no meant something that was negative 
and I spent a lot of my time um, as a younger Miko trying to avoid the word no, trying to avoid the experience of no, where I think over time I realized that no is a good thing. No is a time saver. <laughs> Uh, I find that if I can get my nose quicker, mm -hmm. yeah. I can yeah. get closer to my yeses. Right. Mm -hmm. If there's no opportunity here, then I don't have to take any more time with you, and I can put my energy somewhere else. So I found that getting closer, getting the quicker nose, um, has really has really worked um, to my advantage. But before all of that, you know, before all that epiphany set in, just the experience of knowing all of the energy that went into avoiding it, I think many young women could really learn from not being afraid of no and understanding that no is great. <laughs> no is great and as a younger person you could save so much time. And I think with that, you know, courage and that ability to be able to move through the nose, I think that many of our younger women would be able to get a lot done and just plow through and really get to where they're going. I love that. Um, so what I would add, the question was what society needs to change, and, and I would change a lot, but if there was one thing I could change, it's the messaging around money. That in households today, um, little boys, when we talk to them about money, it's grow and dare and dream and become CEO and in too many households that don't have Girl Scouts in them, it's more save and coupon clip and be careful. And male money media, when we grow up, is CNBC and Bloomberg and Barron's, there's a whole bunch of it and it tends to all be sort of fashioned on sport. You know, the market's opening and buy low and sell high and buy this stock, etc. But the female money media doesn't particularly exist today. And when it does, it's still too much of, take this money quiz, find out your money type. Are you a carrier Miranda when it comes to money? There are too, too many media examples for us of women who are bad with money. Even Carrie Bradshaw, for the, you know, I may be dating myself, but on Sex and the City, she was the cool one. She was the savvy one. She was the one my generation wanted to be, and she was great at everything, but she was bad with money. Um, we, you know, we get this ridiculous advice as women, don't buy the latte, you know, invest the money instead. And like, you, nobody's, I mean, it's very coded gender speak. You know, it's don't have the facial, don't buy the shoes. Nobody's saying to the men, don't but have look good. the, huh? but look good at the same oh, time. Oh yeah, well you have to do that whole makeup thing in order to be presentable. But for men, it's never don't buy the T-bone steak, have the flank steak instead, don't have the craft beer. And so with money, the messages we receive are that it's not really for us. We have to be careful. When you talk to a man about money, and he, he has an analogy of water, and it's a river where money comes in and goes out, and it's up and it's down. And for women, it's a pond. This is it. This is all I've got. And so if I could change one thing, I would make it no longer an attractive female characteristic to be bad with money. Just as it is now attractive to be sporty and to be athletic, and it wasn't some years ago, I would now have it be attractive to be good with money. In fact, today, for so many women, there's no amount of money they make that they don't feel embarrassed about. That it's either too much, oh, my friends, they're going to think, oh, I don't want to make them feel bad, or it's too little, oh, my parent, you know, the student loan debt. And so as a result, we are, as a society, as women, much more likely to talk about sex than money. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm allowed to bring that up in a Girl Scouts thing. <laughs> <laughs> or well, I'll change that to dating <laughs> than money, which is just really, really fascinating. And so I would change, you know, to make money not so masculine. And then, you know, because I don't know that society is going to change because we want it to, what I would urge our girls to do is talk to your dads. Right? Ask your dads these questions. Your dads, you know, will be the ones who, you know, maybe aren't doing business with women-owned companies. Maybe they didn't promote women. I mean, you know, if, if it's the patriarchy, our dads are part of it. And so I go home, and for a long time I realized I wasn't giving my husband or son the benefit of hearing the harassment that I was facing at work. That I, it would happen to me and I would, oh, I don't want to make them feel bad. 
but I wasn't le sharing with them the obstacles that I was facing, and that was a disservice to them. And so I think for the girls, go home and poke your dad, <laughs> right? Are you promoting any women? Are you mentoring any women? Are you putting women on your board? It, you know, are you, are you, you know, helping, taking women on the golf tour? Are you taking women to that meeting, like Britt said, dad? Because dads will do dads for their daughters, Whoa. Right? You know, the, the, the spouses go home and may not work out as well, but you daughters, you got daddy right here. Great. Thank you so much. So that concludes our main session. Um, I want to thank Britt for joining us. We're going to let you get on to your, your counselor. And now we're going to transition to a few questions from girls, and we're also going to take some questions from the audience. Uh, but I'd like to start uh, with just a, a really simple question from the girls. What is the best part of being CEO of your company? Okay. <laughs> um, it's fun to be the boss. Delegation is one of them. <laughs> no, it's, it's fun. Um, you, are, you are building something. You are creating a path. You are creating jobs for people. If your company has employees, you have the ability at LMS to change women's lives. Um, there's plenty that's bad about being CEO. It is. There's a lot of responsibility. Sylvia so laughed too hard on a lot of <laughs> A lot of sleepless nights, but um, you know, somehow as a society we allow men to enjoy the power and to revel in it. And as women, you know, even I'm like, oh, let me tell you the bad things. But, you know, watching your baby grow, your company baby, is a pretty spectacular way to spend the day. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mika? I, I think for me, it's just so personal. I became an entrepreneur because I, I'm a Virgo. And I, just, <laughs> and I just hate people telling me what to do. Yeah. It really bothers me. And um, the success and, you know, the... There's a lot of head nodding around the room. I'm learning a lot about these people. Like, yeah, the financial success came later, but I really became my own boss because I just didn't want anyone telling me what to do. So I think, you know, before we, you know, became these uh, hair gurus and curly kinky wavy hair experts, I think the joy of being my own boss is just the fact that I don't have to listen to anyone and I can do things my way, but you're so right in, the, in that. There's a cost to being the boss, you know? Mm -hmm. When your whole staff walks out on you, or when you make a bad batch, or, you know, when your numbers are down, like, you can't share that with ever, anyone. You know, it's like, you're it, you know, it's all you. But, you know, even that, you know, like, with all the heartache, with all the hard work, I really love being able to make my decisions and doing things my way, um, whether it's good or bad. Thank you. So another question from a girl, what is some of the best advice um, for getting through hardships or setback or failure in your industry? So oh, I've had it. <laughs> um, you know, I've had success and I have been fired on the front page of the Wall Street Journal twice. And I'll tell you the way you get through it. You, you can have, you know, one of two points of view on something like that. One point of view is this is so embarrassing and everybody's gonna know, and I feel ashamed. And another is score, <laughs> right? I was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, for those of you who, when you get fired, you aren't, you know, it doesn't happen that way. You're it's, not on the front page. It's re <laughs> look, it's recognizing that first of all, nobody cares. You know, they might care for three minutes, but the good news is by the time you get into business, it is no longer middle school, and they are not gossiping about you. And if they are, it is not for very long. Mm -hmm. People care much more about themselves. Everybody <laughs> loves a comeback story. And for me, it's, it's recognizing my great good fortune mm -hmm. that I had the opportunity to try and fail. That's a huge opportunity. Mm -hmm. And then I will, again, in part, some part, good part because of my privilege, have the opportunity to do it again if I can work hard enough to get there. Mm -hmm. And so saying this is part of the journey and I love, 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 every no gets you closer to a yes. Recognizing every failure, ever, every firing gets you closer to what you're ultimately going to do. Not because it cosmically works out that way that 
some all, you know, karma or some all knowing big. No, because you will figure it out. Mm -hmm. Because you will take lessons from that failure, hard won lessons, and you will say, okay, I'm not going to work in that kind of job anymore. But the three things I liked about it were I liked the Excel spreadsheet building or I liked the, you know, dealing with smart people or whatever. And you will continue to figure it out until you reach success by not letting yourself get embarrassed about it. And, and knowing a bit about your story, I think it's been important too um, in that some of the things that led to your change in job um, <laughs> and change in role in the company is um, is leading with their values and knowing when um, what's important to you and that you could rest easy at night knowing that you made that yes. decision. So, so look, I appreciate you saying that and I was um, fired for being the only senior executive on Wall Street who partially reimbursed clients for losses in the downturn of 07 08. Yay. Um, and, and look, there's a lot of story. You shouldn't reimburse people when they make, have investment losses, but there were mitigated, we missold products, we made a mistake. And so, great. But you know what? Other people, you know, there are lots of reasons you can get fired. And the lesson still holds. Sometimes the reason you get fired is you suck at your job. <laughs> That's a reason, that's no reason to be ashamed, right? Everybody isn't good at everything, so you might get fired for sucking at your job. Then figure out what you sucked at. <laughs> Am I allowed to say that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to keep it I don't know. rated here. <laughs> okay, good. Figure, okay, yeah, I was just told, hey, okay, not for that. I, right? Look at Sylvia, she'll talk. <laughs> Sylvia, somebody's like, pull it in, Sally. <laughs> But that's okay, and you shouldn't be embarrassed if you get fired because you're not good at your job. You should then figure out what you're not good at and do something else. So that still is another step in the journey towards your greatness. Great. So Mika, do you have any, any uh, times you've come back from a setback? Uh, yeah, um, I, I think what I'm hearing is that everything happens for a reason, and um, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to create something out of the box had there not been failure. And that happened to us very early on. So, you know, when things don't go my way or we blow a deal or something happens um, that's bad and that's not good, I'm searching for there's, there's a reason why this happened, there's some wisdom in this failure, there's some wisdom in this lesson, what is it? And, you know, quickly let me know so I can get closer to, you know, a more successful situation. And that, that's pretty much how it goes now. Great. So let's. Let's hear from the room. Do we have any questions in the room? And I know we also may have some online. If not, I have a good list from girls, too. So what was the moment that confirmed you were headed in the right direction for the Jesse? There were so many moments that uh, indicated that TT and I were in the right direction. But I think when we, uh, when people were coming to Hancock Street, like on Sunday, or is ringing our bell at six in the morning, <laughs> and then if we didn't answer, we would get like, you know, they were called chat rooms at the time. We would get like these nasty customers, and they were so mad with us for not opening the door to sell them a jar of curly pudding. And we were like, what in the world is going on? And um, I mean, that was one. And then like seeing our products um, on Target, on the shelves of Target, two girls from Brooklyn who created this product in our brownstone, working on our clients like uh, the woman who asked the question, just really doing good work, but then seeing the product and making you know, the product readily available for the woman in California or in Texas, she was getting the same hair experience as the women in our salons. I mean, that was also amazing. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other questions? Great, and we have another question online. Um, and Nico, I think you're also poised to answer this one. She'd like to know if you have any book recommendations. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In 2000, I think it was 2012, my sister and I met in New York City and we had lunch and TT said to me, you know, Miko, we, we have more work to do. And I was like, why? You know, we're making so many products, we're just busy all the time. And she says, you know, we're influencers now, we're influencers now, Miko, and we've encouraged primarily women to embrace their natural textures and that created a whole community and we're, you know, 
contrib great contributors to this natural hair movement, but we feel she felt like we needed to really share more of our story. I was like, what story? She was like, how we built our business. She was like, that was an important, that is an important story. And, you know, <coughs> if we tell our story and share not the success part of it, but a lot of the failures, we can really let people know what it takes to be entrepreneurs. So if there's a book that you're interested in reading, read our book, Miss Jessie's Creating a Successful Business from Scratch Naturally. Um, just the theme of this book is if we can do it, you can do it too. I like this book. <laughs> Actually, you know what I'm loving is that you're si you've got your sister right here with you. And what's so clear to me, you know, is you and how important she was and is to you and how you are still carrying her with you, even to where you got her photo here with you. Um, what good fortune that you had her as a, a partner, and I'm sure you really miss her. Oh, I, I miss Titi so much, and I love her. And it, it, you know, mm -hmm. even though she's not here with us in the physical, like every single tube of jelly soft curls, <laughs> you know, all of this curly hair, you know, it was, it was Titi and I, you know, who really thought that it was important that we be helpful. You know, success and financial success came later, but being helpful, we led with that. And uh, Titi, she was just a wonderful human being. So when I'm sitting here with her. You know, I love that. shout out to Titi. <laughs> and what what um, what it's also raising is what, the importance of finding a good partner as an entrepreneur. That some people can do it all by themselves, um, but that many and that's a little bit of our mythology in our country of the lone genius, the, the Steve Jobs. <laughs> But in fact, more innovation happens from a clash of ideas, mm -hmm. from individuals who work well together. And well together certainly can mean, gosh, we seem to think the same. I'll tell you from my co-founder and I, it's gosh, we seem to think differently about everything. <laughs> and in fact, Mikos, you were talking about being the CEO when you get to have your way. I'm like, I wish I got to have my way. <laughs> my co-founder and I, he, he's a he. Um, we, you know, I'm more on the more creative side, even though I used to be in finance and a CFO. He's more on the, you know, get it done process operation side. And we approach things from a different way. Um, and he, I told him last week, he didn't believe it. He's the only person in my life I fight with. He's the only person um, anymore. I'm just too tired to fight with anybody else. <laughs> but um, it's good to have that clash. It's good for us to have that sort of spark to it. And so, you know, look at it when one becomes an entrepreneur, finding that partner um, can be a difference between success and failure. Kind of building on that, I know we probably have some more questions, um, but thinking about, we, all three of you have talked today about being continuously curious and learner. So not just books, but how, how do you keep yourself fresh in the industry or um, continue to learn in your, in your business or even beyond that? So, you know, when you're saying the industry, in a way, I almost don't, I try not to look at what other people are doing, uh, because all that's going to do is pull me over to where they are. And the industry, my industry tried to solve this problem of women not investing enough for years and years and years and spent a lot of money on it. Um, and ended up, you know, the programs were just marketing programs as opposed to changing the underlying product for what we women are looking for. Um, so I almost... Don't tell me what other people are up to. Let me just focus on, we call her L, mm -hmm. who's our, our, our gal. Let me focus on L and what L is looking for and what she does, and so we learn from her. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, put bring her into the office and have conversations with her and her friends. We do mock-ups of web pages and put them on user testing and have her go through them. We do, you know, test online. We, we do all kinds of ways of learning from her. And what's important is she doesn't always know that you have to, um, you know, when we said, well, we're thinking about an Elevest, what if we shouldn't say you should build this? You have to figure out what her needs are and what her gaps are, and then figure out how to fill it, which is much harder than her saying just do X or Y. Mm -hmm. All right, yes, if we have time, we have a few more. Um, someone who is a college student has a question for Sally, and she would like to know, as a student with little income, how can we invest without that? Yeah. 
So um, thank you for asking. <laughs> and in fact, you can, thank you for this leeway into it, you can open an account. Um, Kim, do you remember the code is a Girl Scout? But get it for me. But you can you can open an account on Elevest and you know for all in the Girl Scouts community, we will put fifty dollars in an account for you if you put in the code Girl Scout, so you can start. Mm -hmm. having a Scout, but we went with Girl Scout. Um, so you can actually start later today if you're 18 or older and begin to invest. What I would say for all of us is you should you should absolutely start to invest as soon as you can after you pay back that high interest rate credit card debt that you might run up in college as I did. After if you have auto loans that are high interest rate, you should pay those off because those pull away wealth from you. After you have some amount of money in the bank in case of an emergency. And then when you begin to work or you've got babysitting money, et cetera, put a little bit in out of every paycheck. Just start with, you know, 1% of your take-home pay, 5% of your take-home pay. When you really, when you're hitting it, 10% um, towards retirement, I know it feels like a lot, it might not be achievable, but just begin to make it a habit. And Starting early is so important because a dollar invested in college or in your 20s is worth so much more historically than one invested in your 30s. Why? Because when you invest and you earn a return, then you can earn a return on that return. And then you can earn a return on the return on the return. And then you can earn a return on the return on the return. And so it's not, it doesn't, can't, it doesn't grow like that, it can grow like that. And that's actually been one of the wealth builders in this country is that compounding. Called. So even if in your 20s, oh my gosh, or you know, 18, I don't really have any money, getting started can be really the key. Mm. Oh. Great. Um, well, thanks for being here and speaking to students. So amazing to hear. Um, I'm curious to hear both your perspectives on growing a business by self funding. We hear so many stories about women in particular who try to raise money and the, what, the challenges that they face are coming from primarily investors versus seeking investment, whether that's yep. for friends and family, angels, whatever. My sense is that self-funded grows slower, you retain more control, and if you take yep. investment, then you can grow yep. a lot bigger. And like, I'd, I'd like to hear from your perspectives about um, kind of the trade-offs and, and if you have any right. thoughts about what's better or, or worse. I think it really depends on your business, and I think you've hit the nail on the head that um, if a business is self-funded, you keep control of it, and you may grow more slowly. Um, if you get outside funding, which can be difficult to do, certainly, you have the opportunity to potentially grow more quickly, but then you're in business with people. And um, it is harder today to get rid of an investor in your business than it is to divorce your spouse. Mm -hmm. And most people actually like their spouse better than their investors. <laughs> <laughs> it is just the way it works out. What, you know, my gosh, if, if we're not getting along, how do I get rid of you? Or how do you get rid of me? And so the trade-off is I can grow more quickly, but then they also can fire you. You're probably not going to fire yourself. Probably, right, <laughs> if you're self-funded. But an outside investor can. And so what it does is so many things in life, it takes up the potential return, and it also takes up the risk, right? For me, uh, we built our capital, and I touched on this a little bit earlier, but it took us, it took us quite a bit, you know, it took us some time. Uh, but when the profits come in, you know, it was just a split between myself and my sister. And then there's also the control factor in that, like when my sister passed away in 2014, I imagined had I had investors that might have been a time of panic. Mm -hmm and then a time of major decision making where during that time I had the opportunity to be with my family and just figure mm -hmm. things out without the pressure of, oh my God, in five years they're gonna, they want to cash out and what am I going to do and they're going to, my sister's not here, blah, blah, blah. So I think, you know, for me and my sister, we got into business because we wanted to be our own bosses and I think that value, leading with those values um, by us not having investors, it made our experience as being entrepreneurs a delightful one, where I believe that if we did have investors, even for me by myself, I don't know that I would like the experience of maybe becoming an employee by default or feeling like I'm an employee um, because someone infused some cash into my business. Although if my investors are watching, they're delightful too. <laughs> fully clear. Perfect. Thank you okay. so much.
Hi everyone, my name is Sapreet Saluja. I lead our Strategic Partnerships and New Ventures team here at GSUSA, which includes our wonderful alumni and um, lifetime membership team. And we're so thrilled that you were able to join us today, and Britt as well, shout out to you. Um, <laughs> We all know that Girl Scouts is the preeminent leadership development organization for girls, and now we have launched a network for all of us who want to champion and support and invest in girls. It's called the Girl Scout Network, and we encourage you to join it so that you can learn about exciting alum that are doing things and invest in the power of girls and unleashing their potential. And so in fact, I invite you to consider making an investment today in the change makers of tomorrow by becoming a lifetime member of Girl Scouts. Um, you can do that by visiting girlscouts.org backslash lifetime. And right now, we are running a special promotion <laughs> where you can receive this lovely mug, um, all of you online, as well as all of you in the room. If you're not lifetime members currently, and when you would like to support girls and pay it forward to the next generation, please consider becoming a lifetime member. You can do it if you're in the room um, at the back of the table, and if you are online, you can do it at girlscouts.org backslash lifetime. Again, I want to thank you all for being here, and for those of you who are in the room, I invite you to join us for a reception downstairs in Girl Scouts Central. Um, we look forward to more of these chats together with amazing alum and women who inspire us every day. So thank you so much.